Good morning, Kenmore Alliance Church. Oh, look at you. Look at all of your beautiful faces. Oh, you look so good, man. It's so great to have some people here in the building. It's been a very quiet place. I want to take this opportunity to also thank our online viewers. Uh, why don't we give our online viewers a round of applause as well? We're so grateful you're here with us. Thank you. We are, we are live in person here at 175 Bonnet Avenue, and we are also live online with our church viewers uh, in living rooms throughout western New York. So we're so grateful you chose to spend your time here with us this morning. This is, this is a bittersweet time. It's, it's, a, it's a sweet time that we get to gather and we get to take those beginning steps to open and try this. And so we really appreciate you doing this. We really appreciate our, our cleaning team and our volunteers that showed up to make this happen. Uh, but it's still a little bitter because we can't gather as a whole church body together. And so online viewers, we're so grateful you're here. We're going to continue to make these efforts uh, to, to, to provide both products as best we can uh, in person and online. So thank you for joining us. It's hard to believe it's been over 100 days. It's been three months. We, we built this beautiful building. We were here for two weeks and, uh, and now we're finally back, and so we're grateful to have this room. We're grateful for our AV team being able to, to pivot and work on those things online and in person. Uh, I do want to just explain some housekeeping things as our staff's out in the lobby helping our ushers. You can see, uh, and, and greeters have a name tag if you have any questions. The bathrooms are open. We do have bathroom attendants there to just keep the capacity uh, down for there. Um, imagine, somebody said to me right before this, uh, this service started, they said, imagine we were still in the old room and we had to abide by the 25% capacity. It would be a lot different. But we had at least 100 register for each of the services. And so we're grateful we're able to facilitate that. I do want to point out, as you guys are practicing social distancing and masks, myself, uh, as well as a couple of our singers up here, you won't see wearing a mask. And I'm, I want to explain this, that we are abiding by the law. I'm not above the law. But as long as I'm uh, inside and don't have a mask, I have to at least be 12 feet away from you and this is definitely more than 12 feet but we have a, a line taped here on the on the floor I know you can't see that from home but I want to let you know uh, you don't want to be in the spit radius of your preacher amen uh, even even without a, a COVID-19 crisis, trust me. Uh, so so we're going to keep our distance that way, uh, but uh, we are excited you're here. We know it's going to be different sitting out there. It's another way, it's a little bitter that you, you're gathering with a mask on and you're going to sing and worship, but you know what? It's a great reminder. It's a great reminder to, to remember how God has orchestrated for us and reminded us our priorities. I think of three months ago, I think of 100 days ago when we were building this building. I think, of, I think of last Christmas Eve when I prepared this message to prepare my people for change. I said 2020 is going to be a year of change. Whew. Little did I know. And I was just trying to, to prepare a people for a change, a, a change of venue. We were going to switch rooms. It was going to feel a little bit different. We were going to throw new service times at you. That seems like small potatoes here in June. And so it's, it's a reminder of our priorities that it doesn't matter what room we meet in. We could be in a living room. We could be in that room or this room. It doesn't matter what service time we have, Saturday night, watch it online anytime. Isn't it funny how God shakes what is shakable to, to prove what is unshakable. And the church has never shut down. Can I get an amen? Amen. God's church, God's people are universal. His gospel is universal. No matter what tribe, nation, tongue, land, virus, his gospel remains. His church prevails. And so we continue in that spirit. We continue in that priority this morning. So I just wanted to welcome you here this morning. For, the, for our online viewers or visitors that don't know who I am, I'm Pastor Charles. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we have a, a tremendous staff here that's been working nonstop. I'm so uh, proud to be a part of this church leadership 
Uh, our, everything from our kids' ministries to our compassion ministries have been serving and giving and doing. Many of you have been serving in your D groups and, and serving in compassion ministries and blessing your neighbors and community, being the church. And so although we're open today in person, we haven't stopped. And that's something to, to be thankful and grateful for. I'm going to welcome the worship team out here as I pray for us and as we begin the service. So let's bow our heads. Let's fix our eyes on Christ this morning. And let's give him this, this great time of worship and praise and adoration this morning. Father God, thank you. We have so much to be thankful for. Thank you for providing for us. Even in the midst of trial. Lord, thank you for blessing us with a, with a wonderful, healthy community, Lord. A community of faith. Thank you for the opportunities to serve and to be a blessing in the midst of a lot of fear and worry. Lord, you have been faithful. Your word is proven faithful. We have so much to be thankful for and, 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 and especially the opportunity to start to see some faces again and and interact and have human contact, Father, and so much to be grateful for. But although we also lament and we remember the suffering, we remember our health care workers that have worked around the clock for these three months. We remember families who have suffered from this sickness, many who have recovered, but many who have lost and haven't even had the opportunity to grieve corporately. Father, we remember, we reflect, and we give you thanks. Your word says that we can be thankful, even in trials of many kinds, for you are at work. You are showing your sovereign hand. You are showing your power. You are showing your goodness, your mercy. You're showing the proof of your word. So with this, we, we come before you in adoration and thanksgiving, grateful for this opportunity to worship you and sing praise together and to open your word and hear from your spirit, hear from your, your word. Bless us this day as we seek to bless you, Father, and bless others. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we all say. Hello, my name is Katie. For, you, for those of you who don't know me, um, if you've been following our online services for the last couple months, I've been leading worship for you guys from my couch. So it is wonderful to be here uh, live with you. And for those of you joining from home too, um, I just welcome you to join us, or the team, this morning in worship. You're invited to stand now as we begin to sing of the faithfulness of our great God. No matter where you are this morning, um, we have a great God who is worthy of all of our praise. So let's join and sing together. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart.
worship. Let's confess this morning that we need Jesus Christ. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, and you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you. Sin runs deep. Grace is more, grace is found, it's where you are, where you are, Lord I am free, holiness is Christ in me, where you temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Father God, we need you so desperately. We need you not just through a pandemic. God, we need you all the time, every hour, every moment. God, if anything, this time has just shown us what was always there, just our, our deep, desperate need for a good, sovereign God who's still on the throne, who's still in control, and who's not surprised by anything that's happened to us or anything that's transpired in the last few months. God, we confess that we've tried other things, other relationships, other people to try to satisfy us, but God, you are all we need. You are the answer. You are the way. God, it is so good to worship you with my brothers and sisters here this morning but we know that it doesn't matter where we are, whether we're in a big, brand-new building, God, whether we're at home, whether we're by ourselves, God. You alone are worthy to be praised. 
and you are a good and sovereign God. So we worship you, God. We love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. So, as I said, it's been three months. It's been over 100 days since we've been dealing with this crisis, this scare. And uh, I don't know about you, but as we begin to open up, I kind of step back and look at the different... Uh, the different ways we've handled this. You know, some have said that there's no one alive today that's seen anything like this. Um, and, and so I, I kind of step back and look at these, uh, these ways we've handled it, or phases, if you will. That seems to be a popular term to use right now. Which phase are we in? And, and I see them kind of in big pictures, right? Uh, uh, the, the first thing that we had to do was, was just face the facts. We had to face reality. You remember back in the fall and hearing about this weird virus and it was like, what's going on over in China these days? That's pretty crazy, right? It, it just, it, it, it never dawned on us that this would be on our front doorstep by March. Our very own Kate Ballin, our middle school uh, director, she and her friend who, who like to go on vacations uh, uh, throughout the world and sightsee, in January were in Bangkok, Thailand for two weeks. Why not? Uh, she, she, she'll tell you the story about being there and, and hearing about the virus the first week that she was there, but nobody thought too much of it. By the second week she was there, she was in the mall, and everybody had masks on. It hit that fast. Here in the States, it felt like it was three days, and all of a sudden everything started shutting down. The, the uh, NBA shut their season down, and, and businesses were shutting down, and then we canceled church service, and everybody was trying to figure out what to do. But we had to recognize there is something about this virus. It's a killer, and we needed to face reality, not live in denial about it, and realize we've got to... We've got to react here. And that was the next phase, right? The next phase was we had to lock down and quarantine. We recognized, okay, this thing is a problem. Uh, now we've got to lock down. We've got to quarantine. We've got to stop the spread. Stay home and stay safe, right? And stock up on toilet paper. <laughs> Where did that come from? And so uh, we, we had to face reality, we had to recognize what is, and then we had to do something about it. And we had to stop the spread and take, uh, take precautions. And then now, this third way of dealing with it is we're starting to open up. We're starting to try and find some, some measure of risk we're willing to live with because, uh, let's face it, we're all tired of being home. And so uh, how do we keep businesses going? How do we, how do we uh, uh, get our kids educated? And, and how do we do this? And so we're, we're, we're taking action now, uh, albeit with precaution, albeit uh, doing the best we can with social distancing and masks, but we need to do something. We need to take action and look for opportunities to keep our economy going, to keep whatever the new norm is going. When I step back and see those grand phases, those ways we've handled this, I see the same thing in Scripture this morning. I see the same thing as we've been preaching through the Bible. Uh, I see the same thing in David's writings this morning. And David took these exact three steps when he was dealing what was, with what was most dangerous in his life. And I'll tell you this morning, what he was dealing with was way more dangerous than a virus. Way more deadly. He came to grips with his sin. If you have your Bibles this morning or your devices, if you would please turn to Psalm 51. As David takes the opportunity to deal with his sin and writes about it in Psalm chapter 51. One of my favorite psalms, one of many people's favorite psalms. We're preaching through the book of Psalms right now in our, in our Bible in a year series. 
And David has to deal with his sin. We've been reading about David for a while now in the Old Testament. We've read about him as a shepherd boy. We read about him as a young warrior with a slingshot. Grows up to be a mighty king. He's a musician. He's a poet. But we also read about his sin. He gets off track. He messes up. Most notably, his sin of adultery with Bathsheba. And taking part in the plotting of the murder of her husband. So David's let some people down. He's on the run. His buddy has to come alongside of him and remind him, don't you see what you've done here? And between, between the nudging of his friend and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, David stands before God bare and convicted and pens Psalm 51. Dealing with his sin in what is an amazing example of repentance. How to deal with sin. A, 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 a biblical principle you will read all throughout scripture. It's why Jesus came. <laughs> that we would repent and seek the kingdom of God. So let's dive into the scripture this morning and see See how David dealt with his sin. See how David repented. And takeaways we have this morning from God's word. There's many different psalms. Remember, they used this as their hymnal book in their congregational meetings. Many different psalms. He would write psalms of thanksgiving, psalms of praise. Of course, there's other psalms of lament. There's psalms of prophecy or messianic psalms. And kind of a subcategory in that psalm of lament is also psalms of penitence or repentance as we have here in chapter 51. This is how he starts off. Verses 1 through 5. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. First phase of repentance for David was facing the facts. Can't live in denial anymore. Can't live in hiding anymore. And he has to confess. This is David's confession. The first step of repentance. The first step of repentance before the Lord is confession. Facing the facts. What is David doing here in this, in this opening part of his chapter? He's looking in the mirror. Listen to his, his language here. My transgressions, my iniquities, my sin. There's not one you did this or they did this or but God this happened. He looks in the mirror and says my sin is ever before me. It's right in my face. And so as he's uh, confessing, I see how, uh, the posture that we have to take in order to confess. You know, there's, the Scripture talks about being uh, world, worldly sorrow is just saying, God, I'm sorry. But godly sorrow leads to repentance. And so there's something more to, than just saying, I'm sorry. He takes ownership of his sin. He takes ownership. This is, uh, I messed up. I'm looking in the mirror and I know what I've done. You ever been in that place, right? You, you sleep with it. You wake up with it. You carry it around all day long. You know what you've done. But many of us live in denial and try to act like it's not there. Meanwhile, we go to God in prayer. And he says, I know, God, what I've done. And he takes ownership. I did that. There was a dear brother here at the church who who had a past, had a history, but changed his life around, has been walking faithfully with the Lord. 
And as he, as he changed his life and, and, and did, a, did a 180 in his, in his walk, he still had to deal with the consequences of his sin. And, and he, was, uh, he was facing a court date, and he asked many of us in the church that knew him to, to pray for him, just to pray for, pray for him during this time. And, and his, uh, um, his accountability partner that was driving him to that court date, they were praying in the car, uh, just, you know, praying for mercy, praying for grace. Uh, hopefully the sentencing isn't that bad. Uh, but this gentleman said to his accountability partner these words, you know, I hope there's mercy here in the court today. But even if there isn't, it's okay. Because I did those things. I did that. That was me. What a posture to take of honesty. Parents, isn't it so much easier to work with your kids when they're not trying to, to dive this way or that way and are willing to say, yep, my bad, that was me. I own that. Even as a parent, you can see how much easier that is to work with. Imagine your relationship with God. And that's exactly where David goes, is he fears God, not man. He says to God, against you I've sinned. You're justified in your judgment. He, he knows he's let his family down. He knows he's let his friends down. He knows he's, he's led a bad example as a king. And he, he knows he's going to deal with those consequences. But David has the wisdom, the humility to say to God, but what's most important is that I broke your heart. Yeah, I'm going to deal with the consequences of sin. But God, before you, I broke your heart. This isn't what you had for me, and I sinned against you, God. <laughs> Next week, I've got some time off. It's been a while since I've taken some vacation time uh, from work, and it just so happens that it's the week after we open up. So if there's any problems, uh, you can email anybody else on the staff uh, after today. Uh, I've got the week off, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, it's a bittersweet vacation because it's not a restful time. Uh, my family and I are putting up an above-ground pool at our house, okay? Uh, we have a used pool that a, that a friend gave us a couple years ago that me and my kids had, and some friends had to help uh, go take this pool down, and I've had it stored in my, in my shed. And, uh, and we figured, you know what, all the kids' activities got canceled this summer. We might as well put that above-ground pool up so they have something to do uh, here at the house. And so I was asking around to some different people that I know in my community about what I need to do. And I'm saying, you know, I need to get the sand. Where do I... Where do I get this and how, where, what are the, what's the code and, you know, I've got to go apply for the building permit and the electrical permit. And I had quite a few people say, building permit? Eh, you don't need to do that. Just put the pool up. Eh, they'll never know. Yeah, but what if they drive by and see me with a machine and digging and building a pool? Eh, they won't, they won't drive by. Do you know that? <laughs> Uh, don't they have technology these days? Don't they have Google Maps? Can't they say, uh, Mr. Jones, in 2019, you had no pool, but in 2020, all of a sudden, there's this blue circle in your back, backyard. You think I'm kidding. Uh, how embarrassing that would be, right, for my neighbors. If, if I were to, the, they were to show up and find me or, or make me take the thing down. Hey, the next-door neighbor pastor... Didn't pay for a building permit. How embarrassing that conversation would be with my elders. Hey, elders, I have a benevolent request. I got hit with a pretty huge fine. Any way you could help a brother out? You know what? Scratch that. Forget the embarrassment of my neighbors. Forget the embarrassment of my reputation here at my church. How about my, my stance, my walk before God? How about that he's called me to live above reproach and honestly pay my taxes? Don't live in such a way that you think you're getting away with anything. He sees it all. And David knows this. I've, I've sinned against you, God. And that's what leads him to his root problem. David recognizes that his main problem isn't that he committed adultery. Breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Isn't that he plotted in the murder of Bathsheba's husband, breaking another one of the Ten Commandments. David recognized that his problem is the heart that wants to do that in the first place. I was born in this iniquity. 
in sin my mother conceived me. He recognizes his sin nature. It's my heart that wants to do those things and he recognizes the main issue. Oh, how much you can learn by looking in the mirror. I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for myself this morning. I've taken the opportunity here in the midst of our nation's second crisis, the outcry of oppression and racism and racial profiling. I've taken the opportunity not to point fingers, not to analyze videos, but to look in the mirror. To maybe take a posture that David takes in another psalm when he says, search me, O God, and, and search my heart. See if there's any offensive way in me. And I can see racism in my heart. It, it might not be something that I act on. It might be many times that I act maybe racially ignorant, accidentally ignorant, and insensitive to others. I saw a post, a writing from a, an African-American man who posted a picture of himself taking a walk in his very nice suburban neighborhood. And he had his dog with him and he had his daughter with him. And he said, see, many of you might know, and I'm writing to just educate you on this, that I, every time I take a walk in my neighborhood, I intentionally take my dog and my daughter with me. And he said, the reason why is so that when people see me, they just think, what a loving dog walker and a loving father. And he said, because honestly, if I were to walk in my neighborhood without the dog and without the daughter, many, not all, look and see an African American and wonder what he's up to. Why is he walking down this neighborhood? Intentional, accidental, but I see that in my heart. I've done that. Just like my, my, my brother who's been growing in his faith. You know what? I've done those things. And so it's an amazing opportunity when you can look in the mirror. Isn't that what Jesus encourages us to do? Before you remove the splinter from your brother's eye, why don't you look in the mirror at the plank in your own? Be careful how you judge others because that same judgment will be done unto you. This church, the Church of God, Kenmore Alliance Church, has never promoted anything but loving all that are equal. We denounce racism. We would never promote it. We are looking for opportunities of ways that we can minister to this community and do better. But it starts with me. Confession. I need to take ownership. I need to, I need to fear God. You know, it, it is a scary time out there, right? There's a lot of video cameras. We wanted, we wanted police officers uh, uh, to, to wear cameras, right? We drive around now with cameras on our dashboard. And that's all fine and well on YouTube when we're watching what those cameras catch for somebody else. Are you ready for that camera to be in your living room? In your bedroom? In your car, facing you, catching every uh, point of rage and anger and malice. But you know what? Scratch that. Don't fear YouTube. Don't fear man. Fear the camera that is on your heart 24-7. God knows the heart. That's what matters. And that's what led, uh, led me to my root problem. There are, there are ways, there are things that are a problem. But to fix a problem is almost pointless unless I fix the problem that will cure my heart that wants to do those things. Otherwise, it's just behavioral change. It's not curing a diseased heart. Racism is a problem, and it is prevalent. Whether we like it or not, whether you experience it on a daily basis or not. Addiction is a problem. Sex trafficking is a problem. Abortion is a problem. They are all problems. They are all symptoms of the problem, man's sin. 
our sin nature that is incapable of doing good apart from Christ. The first step of repentance is recognizing the problem to face it, face the facts and own it. David goes on in verses 6 through 12. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. As David comes bare before the Lord, confessing his sins, facing the facts, this virus is a killer. I now need to hunker down. I need to cleanse. I need to be cleansed from the inside out. I need help in this. I need divine help. Listen to the language he uses. Uh, You care about the inward being, right? Not just about the behavioral. Jesus made this clear when he showed up on the Sermon of the Mount. He said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm telling you, if you've looked at another woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. He cares about the inward being, not just behavior. You want to get to the problem, go all the way. All the way. You care about the inward being. Purge me, Lord. Wash me. Blot out. In this cleansing, he says, I need it to be removed. I need it to be eradicated from me. I need surgery. I need heart surgery. And Lord, I can't do it on my own. I need you to do this for me. Uh, Cut this off. I need to be pruned. It's the same language Jesus uses when he says, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Jesus speaking in hyperbole, but making his point. better, Better to enter heaven missing a limb rather than get to hell whole. We need to deal with our sin. It needs to be removed. Uh, He goes on to say, I need to be renewed. I need a clean heart. I I need a right spirit. I need your presence. Create in me a clean heart. Renew me. For for I was born in sin. I need to be transformed. Same thing Paul says in Romans 12. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to be rewired. And one of the greatest medicines for that is the presence of God. Notice he says, cast not your presence from me. God never leaves him in the midst of this. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Right? I I, I need God to do this in me or or I'm hopeless. And that's what leads him to restoration. Remove the sin, renew my heart, and restore to me the joy of thy salvation. One of my favorite verses in this passage. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Again, he gets right to the root issue. What matters most is that I'm right before you, God. Same thing the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1. He says, Peter says, all of this trial, all of the refining, what is its end result? The salvation of your souls. That's the point in this. I need to be cleansed. With repentance, we need cleansing. I need Jesus to remove, renew, and restore me. Otherwise, it is a band-aid. Otherwise, it's behavioral change. I need to get at the heart of the issue. And I need to recognize the priority in that. I learned this lesson and continue to learn this lesson from my wife. My wife suffers from a chronic illness, chronic pain an autoimmune disease. She was diagnosed with lupus. And it rears its ugly head in many different ways that she deals with. And on top of the physical pain and the different ailments she experiences, there's the emotional of wanting to do so much more in life, but being limited in her health capacity. And when she tells me that God is teaching her so much through this, 
And when she says this phrase to me, I'll never forget the first time I heard it. I didn't get it. I feel like I still don't fully get it. And she can say to me in tears and say, feeling better is not the goal. What? Feeling better or being cured of my disease is not the goal. Sure, it would be nice. But what's more important, the priority in this, is that I walk in faith and trust and hope that my God's got me in the midst of this trial. Because not all of our circumstances get fixed. Not all of our trials get fixed. Jesus came and healed some. He didn't heal all. He freed some. He didn't free all. But he ultimately fixes it. And so I need to recognize this, that although we need to all uh, rebuke racism or rebuke addiction or abortion and we need to get in those fights and we need to fight for God's justice in those ways, we need to recognize that the goal is trusting God in the midst. I know that sounds extremely insensitive during a time like this. You mean you're going to tell your oppressed brother, your oppressed sister? I'm going to tell you what I see in the scripture. That even the son of God, who did no wrong, who was sinless, was unjustly tried, unjustly arrested, unjustly murdered. Yet for the joy set before him, he endured that trial. And so there is correction. There is rebuke for the sinner that would do these things. Repent, don't do these things. But there is also teaching for the victim. As David says, don't put your trust in chariots or horses or swords. Your trust has to be in the Lord Jesus. Read the, read the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. The, the, the people of God that were sawn in two, that were, that were put on lanterns in the front courts of, 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 of Roman courtyards that are recognized for all of eternity because of their faith in God. And they're getting theirs now on the other side. Amen? There is teaching for all of us in this. Many of you hear me say that truth and you immediately jump to the conclusion that that also then means I'm saying, so then you do nothing? Well, it's not the racism isn't the problem. Fixing racism isn't the ultimate goal. Or abortion. We're in that fight. We've been at that fight. How are we doing? We're losing. We're losing in a lot of these battles. But the goal is to be faithful. The goal is to honor God. Be witnesses. Love God and love. What's most important to Jesus? Love God and love your neighbor. Be faithful with what God's given you. But but to say to focus on truth, both my sin and my hope, isn't to say do nothing. That truth isn't an excuse to sit on your hands. In fact, you've been given a job to do in the midst of. And this is exactly where David goes in this passage. Listen to his words in verses 13 through 15. Then, I've brought my sin before you. I've been honest. I've called out in confession. I've asked for your cleansing. You need to purge this within me. And in that forgiveness, in that hope, what does David do? Hey, I've been forgiven. I'm not at fault anymore. No, he gets busy. He gets his hands dirty. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. I will teach your truth and sinners will return to you. I'll say to others, don't do as I did. You need to hear the truth too. You need to hear the gospel. Jesus says, in your repentance, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Remember, remember, repentance is action. It's commitment to change your direction. I say I'm sorry. I repent. I'm honest before the Lord. I'm cleansed and I go the other way. And I take new action and I do differently. I don't continue in that sin. A believer does not continue in sin. The love of God is not in him, but turns and goes a different direction. David's commitment to do better, 
begins with teaching sinners repentance, sharing the gospel, being a witness for others. What did Jesus tell you to do? Go and make disciples, church, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that Christ has commanded. Yes, do justice. Yes, defend the oppressed. Defend the widow, the orphan, those that can't speak for themselves. So do your ministry. I'm so grateful to be part of a church who, who people have gotten passionate about this. Uh, a, a woman gets passionate about uh, the, 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 the poor families in our community that need clothes. So she starts a clothing uh, ministry and that expands and expands and expands. Uh, another person who was burdened in, in their heart for the, the hungry. So I want, to, I want to put together a soup cafe and feed the hungry. Will Marcy, who gets burdened to minister to the shelterless and the homeless, and I want to minister to them. Two ladies from our church that are burdened for the, 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 the injustice of abortion, and they start Northtown Pregnancy Center, now Compass Care. Melissa Christian and others that are burdened for refugees and say, I want to minister we're in, we're in fights all over. Brother and sister, is God stirring your passion in how to help your community fight this injustice of, of racism? The church is here to fan that into flame, to resource you. This is all parts of the gospel. And we need to teach this truth and get involved. Many of you know that I'm a trained EMT and firefighter with Grand Island. I'm an emergency medical technician. I'm not a doctor, but I am trained to go so far. I'm trained in the field with that patient, whether it be a car accident, medical emergency, trauma, fire, to treat that patient for the 15 minutes that I have them before they're ultimately transported to a hospital to see a doctor. I don't have the luxury or the MD at the end of my name to diagnose the disease and treat them in the long term. But I am called to treat the symptom because even though the symptom is pointing to a greater disease, they could still die from the symptom. They're bleeding to death and I need to be, get my hands dirty and work and serve. Consider yourself a first responder, an EMT, to be busy doing the Lord's work and getting people to the physician, to the healer. He says, I'm going to sing of your righteousness. I'm going to shout it out. I'm going to declare your praise. He wants to live in such a way, that he, such a loud way that, he's, that he puts his different direction on display. And notice this. This is fascinating to me. David, who lives in the Old Testament, before Christ, before the new covenant of grace, he lives in the Old Testament model of sacrifices to God, of bulls and goats, Right? That's how you make sure you walk in favor and in righteousness with God. But David is wise enough to recognize that even in God's system, that was just a, symboliz a symbolizing obedience. What God really wants is a changed heart and obedience. Because he writes these words at the end of the chapter. You will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. Wait a second, David. God said he wanted sacrifice. No, 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 no. You're missing it, guys. If, you, if he delighted in sacrifice, I would give it. But you are not pleased with a burnt offering. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. Then he goes on to say, then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings. Otherwise, it's just behavioral. It's just checking off the boxes. But if my heart is right, all of those good works, all of those deeds, God finds and is pleased in them. They're not just social, social ministries. If your heart is right before the Lord, he is pleased in them. And finally, yes, even David stands in the gap for others. The action he is going to take as he says in this closing verse, do good to Zion in your good pleasure, Lord, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Even David prays for his nation, prays for his people, and stands in the gap. 
Well, pastor, that may be a problem going on in the rest of the country. It's not my problem. Are we too proud to intercede for others? I am so blessed by a faithful few that gather every Wednesday night to pray for the church prayer list that many of you are on or have been for your job concerns, for your health concerns, and they show up weekly to intercede for you for God because they love you and they care for you because they love God and they love his church. Did we, did we so quickly forget reading Ezra and Nehemiah who went on to do great things, rebuilding Rebuilding for God. And how did they both start? Praying and confessing even for the sins of the people that they might have not personally committed. Listen to Nehemiah's words in chapter 1. I confess the sins of the Israelites. Including myself and my father's family that have committed against you. We've acted wickedly toward you. We've not obeyed the commands, the decrees, and the laws that you give your servant Moses. And so his repentance leads him to action. Many different actions. And so there is teaching here for the sinner. Stop it. Repent. There is teaching here for the victim. Put your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ. He's the only one that will fix it and make it better. And there's teaching here for the person who's wondering, what can we do? There is, the sky's the limit. How are you doing in your repentance? Are you looking in the mirror? Are you taking ownership of your sin? Not, <laughs> Jesus says to Peter on the beach, don't worry about John. I've called you to follow me. Don't worry about him. How are you doing seeking to be remade from the inside out? You can't do it alone. You, I, I, I know I'm dying of a, of a cancer called sin. And I need the chemo poured inside of me. I need God to change me from the inside out. Go all the way. God, God's a gentleman. He's, he's, he's waiting for you to give him access. Let him do heart surgery. His surgery doesn't hurt, by the way. It heals. And how are you committed to a changed direction? What can you learn from, you name the crisis, you name, whether it's COVID, whether it's racism, whether it's any of the problems we deal with in this that Jesus said we were going to experience. How can you be changed? Leave your sin and go a different direction. Jesus came to preach a ministry of repentance. We should be a people of repentance. We're no better than them. Than any of them. Pastor said it this week. Apart from Christ, I'm the one kneeling on somebody's neck. Apart from Christ, I'm the one throwing a rock through a window and looting. Apart from Christ, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for this example we have in David, who was an amazing man after your own heart, yet was full of flaws, full of issues, but yet you didn't depart your presence from him. Lord, you, you offered him an opportunity of repentance and forgiveness. And I pray that we would walk in that as well. Bless us with your word. Bless us with our community. Bless us with the opportunity to repent and be your witnesses. Why would the free choose to be slaves? 
Why would the living return to the grave? Why would I ever do anything to break your heart, Jesus? I'm turning away from the sin that you every evil you overcame you have forever made a way for me to be where you are I'm turning away from the sin that you plenty for all of us to own. And you know what Paul writes in Corinthians to the church, he says, you know, I don't judge the person outside the church as if to say I expect, I expect sinners to sin. And man, we all know this, right? Satan is having a field day right now. Our country is divided in so many different ways. But I hear Jesus' words, I hear Paul's words, not so with you. Church, if we ever had a time to love one another, to trust one another, to remember who you're, you're talking to, don't let social media ruin the ability to reason with one another. If you're speaking to a dear brother or a sister who you know loves the Lord and loves the church and loves their neighbor, they may be passionate in one way or the other than you are. And you know what? You need them in your life. God designed it that way. I need those people that are the constant, uh, what are we doing? How are we doing it better? I need the pebble in my shoe because I don't got all the answers. I don't have it all together. And others need, uh, we need people that when we're passionate about something, they say, careful. 
Just remember, do, do your thing, but remember the disease, remember the sin. We need all of this. And so my benediction for us today is in that repentance, preserve the unity of the church. We cannot be divided. Paul says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility and gentleness and patience. Listen to this. Bear with each other. Bear the burdens of each other. Don't take it personally. Or rather, take it personally. Jesus took it personally. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. May we be a church that's not perfect, but through repentance is forgiven. Amen? Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for joining us at home. This service will now be the the recorded video service for online at your convenience. God bless you. Have a great rest of the weekend.